7 o'clock, and at this time I'd like to call the March 27th, 2012 Planning Board meeting to order. The first item on the agenda are minutes for the March 13th. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the minutes from March 13th with the corrections that I had received. Second. I have one or two little tiny corrections that are probably the same as everybody else's. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is an approval not required. <clears throat> Applicant Eleanor Maurer to subdivide 2.27 acres into two lots located at 631 Quaker Road, North Falmouth. Is there someone here for the applicant? Hmm, I guess not, huh? Any comments or any questions from the board from maybe Mr. Curry? I don't have any questions. I have to answer any of the boards. Any comments from the staff? I have no comments. I visited the site. This is the end of my assessment is the road is adequate. So they seek to subdivide this existing parcel to two lots, so that green line is the line of division that they seek to uh, create here on this plan, and I can recommend to the board that you can endorse it for approval not required. Okay. Uh, any comments or questions from the board? I understand that that road, William Road, is not a paved road. But that is the road that provides the frontage for the two lots. One lot, one lot has road has a frontage on Quaker Road. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. it provides the frontage for the new lot. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? No frontage. Entertain a motion to uh, accept the, uh, so the approval not required. So moved. Supposed to be one fifty. And I have a second. Second. Further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is a public hearing. The applicant uh, David Wald, modification of definitive plan to modify the road layout at 26 and 43 Gerloff Road. Falmouth. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, uh, the notice of this public hearing was published in the Enterprise on March 9th, March 13th, and March 20th of 2012. 26 of Butters notices were sent by certified mail on March 9th, 2012, and 24 signed receipts were returned. Thank you. Public hearing protocol will be as published in the on the back of the uh, of the uh, agenda. The um, first item uh, on the on the <coughs> on the hearing is a uh, presentation by the applicant, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Bob Ament. I'm an attorney here in Falmouth. I represent the, the applicant, who is uh, Dave Wald. The plans uh, have been prepared by Falmouth Engineering, Mike Borselli's company, and uh, Mike is here. Um, there are a couple things going on with this um, plan. It's basically just the adjustment of some lot lines among existing lots. It's not the creation of any more um, lots. The existing lots <coughs> on this extension of Gerloff Road, which was approved a couple of years ago, um, are a lot that includes this house under construction, a lot that includes that house under construction, and a third lot which um, the owner plans to build a house soon. So there are three existing lots 
and there are no new lots being uh, created. And these lots, by the way, are uh, exceeding an acre each in a neighborhood close to downtown Falmouth that has small, much smaller lots all around. The lots as they were laid out are quite awkward. Um, there is a T turnaround that was approved by the planning board. And this is that T turnaround. So the lot that's back here, again, it's a large lot in a neighborhood of older, smaller lots, but its frontage is along here. That's the, and the end of the T turnaround. And the frontage for this lot is here, and the frontage for this lot is here. Now the result of that for the Walds, who are building their house here, is that presently a portion of this lot flares out right in front of their house. So they don't own this yellow triangle of property. And so one of the things that's going on with this plan is something you'd normally see on an approval not required plan. It's simply a swap of even areas of land between two neighbors. The uh, uh, Crossleys, I think the neighbors who own that property, have agreed to convey this triangle to Wald in exchange for an equal area of land which is this, that's actually this equals that. And this land near the garage of the Crossleys is more desirable for them and they don't have any interest in this, but it being right in front of the Wald's house, it makes a lot of sense. Now, how can we do that? We can do that because the remaining frontage on the T turnaround meets the requirement for frontage the 100 foot requirement. <coughs> the T turnaround was bigger than was necessary. That's what that's all about. So the yellow on the plan simply shows a swap of land. We wouldn't need to be here with a public hearing and a uh, subdivision modification if that's all we were doing. But the other thing that we're doing is proposing to take what's now a bit of the roadway. This area marked in blue. I think it measures uh, 25 by 44 feet. And we're going to take that out of the road because it isn't needed and convey it to, to Wald um, so that in addition to this triangle in front of their house, this is actually the practical matter in the front of the house, this will also be part of their property. And that's agreed to by the owners of both these lots. We actually have a purchase and sale agreement that says that's okay, that concerns these and also concerns that with the cross lease. And we already have the notarized signed release of any rights uh, with respect uh, to the Mayokos who own this property with respect to lot 23. And that's what requires a modification of the subdivision plan because we are, in a sense, shortening the road. We're actually shortening. Um, a side of the T turnaround of the road. This is that same area, and the pavement, when it gets finished, the re it is of sufficient size to meet the requirements of the uh, planning board's rules and regulations for subdivisions, which requires that the T turnaround be 80 feet long, and this is actually still 100 feet long. Um, and this has been, as I understand it, reviewed by the fire department. They're fine with it. And so the road won't include this bit. But the road will still have a T turnaround. It's a little bit of a lopsided T. That's all. Now, there's another reason we want to do this, although I don't think, I think I could stop now and it would make sense. This still complies with the subdivision rules and regulations. The neighbors are all in favor of it we could stop there. But we're doing this for another reason as well. The Wilds want to have an accessory structure over here. It's, a, it's actually a, not to be used as a garage, it's a barn. Um, and 
with the present layout and in here, it's within the proposed locations within 50 feet of the present layout. It's 15 feet from the rear yard line. But the question is then, is this an accessory structure in a front yard if it's over here? Now this is the, you know, the shape of this lot is screwy as is. It still will be a little bit even with the adjustment. Right now, the shape of the sock goes like this, and it goes like this, and the house is over here. But where is the front yard? I'm really not sure. And I'm not sure the building commissioner is sure, but he hasn't been willing to agree that that there's not, um, you know, that that building as proposed, even on this plan, isn't in the front yard. But at least by making this change, the accessory structure will be 50 feet back from any portion of the, the road. And so we avoid a problem of needing a variance. We'll still go to the Board of Appeals for a special permit because the building commissioner feels we should. Um, <coughs> since the house is only 42 feet from the frontage and the accessory structure will be 50 feet from the frontage, I don't understand how it can be in the front yard. I don't understand how an accessory structure farther away from the street than the principal structure can be considered to be in the front yard. But I've had this discussion with the building commissioner. He thinks we should get a special permit, so we're going to be doing that. But by moving the street away from the building area, uh, we will uh, uh, avoid the need for for a variance, and all we need is the typical special permit required whenever you have an accessory structure in a front yard, but not closer than 50 feet to the street. So we'll meet that standard, we'll just need a special permit, so we'll be doing that. The, uh, again, the, the other neighbors on this Gerloff court um, are, uh, we have their approval for that special permits. So that's, that's why we're here. Um, it's a subdivision modification, but one which doesn't create another lot. That simply makes a better lot, uh, actually, for both people involved in the swap. Any questions for me or Mike? Well, questions from the board for yeah. Mr. Ahmed? Yes, uh, where is the driveway currently? How do you access? Is, is there a garage to that structure? Uh, the garage will come off of here, and I think, Mike, do you re Recall is the garage here or is it here? But it's this way. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. And has that been uh, laid out and uh, roughed in yet? It's or? all built. I mean, okay. they, uh, they, the house is, is framed. Have you been there recently? I believe the driveway's finished this year. Dave Wild has now arrived. Drive, got a driveway yet? Um, the garage is there. It's built. And there's, you know, the driveway isn't built. Anyway, so you'd be so coming off the T. Driver comes driveway. off the end of the T. Okay. And yeah. it'll have, and it'll it's that way regardless of how long yeah. the road is. Yeah. Okay. Further questions from the board? Do all three houses use that that road? Is this house way back? <coughs> have another access? I uh, know all three come off up Girl Off Road, mm -hmm. and this is an existing driveway to get to. Uh, the Crossley's house, and I believe that the driveway for the Mielka house will be off this end of the, of the tee. Further questions from the board? Any comments from the staff? Uh, no, sir. It's a simple modification, but for the uh, alterations to the layout, it would be a simple and our plan, but we, have, we don't have any, find anything extraordinary about the I have one question. Uh, is the port, the paved portion of the pork chop, has that been put in yet? No. At least not when I was last out there. It's not paved yet. Okay. But there are plans to pave it? Uh, yes, there will be what's shown on the plan will come to be paved. <coughs> All right, then uh, the next uh, item on our hearing is to ask for questions. From the board Ralph, excuse me, I have one question. Yeah. Is there any change in the amount of paved area for the public road or the road there? Is there well, it, it actually will be a little bit less because uh, 
this layout, though it meets the uh, subdivision rules and regulations, it's uh, shorter. Um, now, I guess that the <coughs> there'll be less pavement in the uh, street if the Walds and the Mayokos pave their driveway. Right. It won't be much. I would think it would be somewhat, uh, might be narrower. But it's not an increase. It's probably a, it's a reduction in required paving. Okay, then, no other questions from the board. Then I will solicit comments from the public, and if you would be kind enough to take the podium and identify yourselves for the uh, TV audience and, and us. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Burton. I'm one of the abutters. I'm actually right uh, back here um, on Belvedere Road. Uh, so the reason I'm here tonight is I received a number of notices from the appeals board um, for the past couple of months uh, about a hearing for the, what the applicant was going for for putting this structure here, um, which is roughly just under 1,000 square feet from what I was able to discern from the uh, appeals board um, in the front yard. So, and that's been postponed a number of times. So I'm just assuming and maybe you can help me out, Mr. Chairman and the board or the uh, applicant's representative. Um, is this part of the reason why this is being adjusted now? So that structure, uh, and I'm not exactly sure where, but I believe it's right around here, uh, is going to be put in the front yard. Is this required, in other words, for them to be able to go and deal with the special permit of the uh, appeals <coughs> board? I think, Mr. Ahmed explained that partially when he was up there the reason one of the ancillary reasons for conveying that piece of property in the blue dash there to the uh, people that uh, own the lot the, the house that's being built would you mind going over that again mr. Ahmed um, so that you can explain to mr. Uh, Burton, why, why, uh, how it, how it facilitates your not having to get a variance, but still having to get a special permit. I think that's what you said. Is that a <clears throat> road? Am I close? It's a private. Yeah. You're right on. That's right. We actually uh, thought, and I still think that the adjustment of the street should avoid the necessity for any zoning relief, but the building commissioner, um, based on the conversation I had with him, uh, agrees that it avoids the need for a variance, but he feels that we're still in a front yard, so we need a special permit. Now, one thing that's different about a Board of Appeals proceeding <coughs> and a planning board proceeding on a subdivision modification or a subdivision itself for that matter is that as long as the applicant meets the uh, standards of the subdivision rules and regulations, the planning board is obligated to approve the, uh, approve the plan. Um, be no real reason why you wouldn't in this case. We are, as I said, shortening a road. The three people with frontage on the road are in favor of, of this. Um, but we're, we're doing it for two reasons. One is because the Walls ought to own the property that's right in front of their uh, house, right in front of their front door. And the uh, neighbors are happy to give up uh, rights they have uh, to that portion of the road. And it's simply unnecessary. The road is bigger than is required by the rules and regulations. This is just a road for three houses. It's not a major thoroughfare. But by moving the end of the T away from uh, well, further uh, to the uh, west, I think it is, the, uh, there is more room on the lot to locate an accessory structure so that an accessory structure can be oriented the way the walls would like to take advantage of, uh, of solar panels and uh, be 50 feet away from the street and also be a little farther away from the rear lot line, that is, uh, from the 
the Burton property. So that's, uh, I believe, a 15-foot setback is proposed instead of um, a minimum. Also, um, they could build an accessory structure even <coughs> if the road were not changed and be 50 feet back, but only if they oriented the house 90 degrees the other way, which would put more of it uh, along the, the Burton property line and 10 feet from the line. Uh, and it wouldn't work for solar energy. So these are reasons why we want to make the lot uh, um, you know, more suitable for, for use by the water. But all those reasons that relate to uh, the Board of Appeals uh, proceeding uh, really are, have, shouldn't affect the decision of the, of the planning board. I think that they would lead you to understand what we're trying to do and be even more in favor of it. But I think you have to be in favor of this because it meets the rules and regulations under the uh, town's uh, uh, subdivision rules and therefore it should be uh, approved. It's what the owner and the other neighbors on the street want. Would it be fair to say that the uh, possibility of the delays at the Zoning Board of Appeals because they were waiting for this decision first? Well, it, it, in fact, uh, the postponement of the Board of Appeals hearing was, was each of them was requested um, by uh, us as the applicant in the hope that we would uh, get a determination from the building commissioner that no um, hearing would be required at all and to at least get his confirmation that a variance is not required, which which <coughs> which uh, he's agreed to. Okay. So it wasn't with contingent? The, with, with this change in the, to the plan. Oh. So it was contingent upon our our decision on the changing this well, was well, one of the reasons. The right? application of the planning boards, <coughs> I'm sorry, to the Board of Appeals stands on its loan because we requested a variance based on the existing layout. Mm -hmm. uh, along the way, we realized that a better solution uh, was for a number of reasons, not just for that accessory structure, but again, because of the shape of the road was uh, cut in front of the walled house unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. just didn't need to be. So that's, we're changing that. Okay. Does that answer your question, I, Mr. I Burton? I just have one other question. Sure. I just with uh, Bob Ahmed just mentioned about that road being unnecessarily there. It just common sense is just bringing up the question to me is that uh, the Waltz developed this entire subdivision, and knowing that that T was going to be there, they built the house there anyway. They knew that road was going to be there, so. I'm just thinking if they knew that that was going to be the case, why wouldn't AU submitted the um, plans without that blue area there to begin with? Or number two, if you knew that that was going to be right in front of the house, why, would, why hadn't you gone from the planning board previous to setting out the application for the uh, Board of Appeals? Those are just the only questions I have. Mm -hmm. Mr. Allen. Well, the answer to that one is really easy. The uh, people involved um, with this plan, uh, before I got involved, uh, didn't see the opportunity to, to accomplish this with a shorter road. And uh, I didn't even see this as a better solution until we were into the permitting process looking for a special permit and started to think about the fact that we'd really like to be able to avoid the necessity for a variance. Now, as you know, a variance can be granted, one of the reasons, based on the um, unusual shape of a piece of property. And um, this is certainly an unusually shaped uh, property. By making it somewhat less unusually shaped, um, we actually avoid the need for a variance. And that's what we're doing. There's simply no reason why the planning board would not have approved this plan if it was originally um, submitted to the board. And so Mr. Burton is absolutely right to ask, you know, why are we here? And said, well, we're here because we know more about it and understand it better and, and have a better solution than 
was uh, presented to the planning board, which the planning board approved. The planning board isn't obligated to tell people you can build a smaller road and so on. And you looked at what the plan was and it was approved. Well, this is a better plan than what was originally approved by the planning board. It's better for both of the two lots that will be adjusting the lot line. And it's better because if we can make roads shorter and have less pavement and have uh, somewhat more uniformly shaped lots, um, we should just do it. There's no reason not to do that. Other comments from the, from the public? <clears throat> yes, sir. Please. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Dave Wald, and I'm the builder and developer. And I just want to go through a little bit of history that originally this was uh, approved for a 20-unit condominium. You probably all know that. And uh, we worked something out with the neighbors not to do that. Um, and this area here where our first unit was going to be was fairly stripped. This is fully treated. This is a great place to put solar panels. I could put the boat behind, but I'll be next to someone. I have to be next to someone. I'm on an acre and a quarter when my neighbors are on one-eighth acre. I have one house. That's the zoning. I could put it back here. I could attach it to the building and not need any permit at all. But what works best for solar energy which I didn't know what I was going to build or what the design was or what my ideas were when the road first went in. First you design the home, then you figure out where to go, and you bring it to the engine. So this, that's how we came. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Further comments from the public? Okay, then. Um, there's no further comments from the public. I will close the hearing and uh, uh, entertain a motion to take it under advisement. So moved. <coughs> moved, seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. We now, we now have the option of um, Voting on the uh, voting on this uh, request tonight, or bringing it up at a future meeting. So, Ken, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we discuss this tonight and okay. vote on it after discussion, if need be. What do we do? We what? What the <clears throat> correct language is that we waive our. Uh, and I don't have help me out. You would ask for a motion to waive your, your standard protocol of not voting the same night that you hear a plan. Uh, it just takes a majority vote. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Would you be willing to do that? I, I would make that motion. Yes. Okay. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. We will now take <coughs> this request for a change in the uh, modification of the definitive plan under discussion. Um, comments from the board? Pat? I think I've been on the board probably since this <coughs> plan first came before us and it's gone through. No, not quite. was even before that. Uh, 10, 15 Ooh, That years. was ancient then. Um, <coughs> this is a huge improvement from what we first saw. As Mr. Wald said, what was it, 22 condominium units? Very much impacted by that development. And this is a tremendous <coughs> improvement, and I see the recommended changes here as being even a further improvement. Um, I strongly would vote in favor of this. For the comments? Ken. What, what I've seen here is, is as, as was presented, there's no reason from what I've seen on this plan that we wouldn't have approved this particular, as it's written right here with a road, because it's still 115 feet long and 44 feet wide. So, and the land, the lines are, there's nothing that we wouldn't have <coughs> to begin with. 
as written. It'll, it'll be 100 now. Yeah. Well, 115, I think. The, um, it's these turnarounds, uh, Mr. Curry, are, uh, I mean, these t pork chop things are basically for allow vehicles to turn around, um, aren't they? Yes. Okay. In, 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 in that, that particular way it's laid out there, the pavement is laid out within the layout. Um, it looks to me as though it would be probably adequate. Um, yes. Is, do you agree with that? Yes, because it comports with your rules, so there's an assumption of adequacy. Okay. Further comments from the board? <clears throat> All right, then I'll entertain a motion. Um, to, yes, sir. Yes, we, we took a deliberate of drafting one for you, anticipating oh, okay. such a discussion. So uh, I... <clears throat> Doug, would you be kind enough to read this uh, draft motion? Yeah, March 27, 2012, draft uh, regarding Gerloff Road definitive subdivision modification, uh, 47C03, 013, 017, and 018. Motion that the planning board vote to approve the application of David Wald under Article 4, Definitive Plans, Chapter 305, Subdivision Regulations of the Town of Falmouth, for a plan entitled Plan of Land Being Subdivision of Lots 17 and 18 and 20, as shown on Land Court Plan 73461, prepared for David Wald in Falmouth, Mass., prepared by Falmouth Engineering Incorporated, dated February 21, 2012, scale 1 inch to 20 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. This application seeks to modify the turnaround of the proposed road layout. The Planning Board finds this acceptable given the volume of traffic expected to be generated by the three existing house lots. Furthermore, the Planning Board finds that the 900 square foot exchange of land between lots 26 and 27 to be acceptable. Finally, the Board finds that the Town of Falmouth has already received a bond in the amount of $20,000 on May 4th, 2011, and shall not require any additional surety. Waivers, no waivers from the Planning Board rules and regulations are hereby granted. Conditions, one, prior to definitive plan endorsement, the applicant shall submit an electronic copy of the above reference plan as portable document file, PDF format. Second. Discussion. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. <coughs> the next item on the agenda. <coughs> Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a discussion draft of the uh, of the first outline for the wind turbine bylaw. <clears throat> um, Pat, you are the uh, you are the point person on this. Would you like to um, lead this discussion? I certainly don't mind doing so. I have two, two pieces of paper that are titled Wind Energy Systems, and one is has a little bit more verbiage under number four and five. I printed the other one from at home. Does everybody have the one? It may be in your packet. Um, yes, it the was. one that uh, does everybody have mm -hmm. that one? The one that has verbiage under four and five, um, and then um, I don't know, Ma Marlene. Would you like to maybe lead us, uh, make some opening comments on this? Because I believe you've drafted um, w uh, along with Pat this uh, this this, this uh, the beginning of this uh, outline for our 
wind turbine bylaw? Okay. Um, Maybe if you want Pat to do it, I mean, no, I, do you I have no problem. I think uh, it's important tonight for the board. This is the first outline right. uh, put together for you. It's just that uh, in the background, I think we have a lot of the information you see under three and four and five. <clears throat> but I think it's vitally important for the plan board tonight to start out with the very fundamental questions of you know, why are we doing this? And then if we can answer that, then what do we want? And you'll find that under paragraphs one and two. And it asks some very basic questions about purpose and applicability. And they're somewhat interchangeable. And if the board members are more comfortable with the more specific questions, perhaps found under applicability, you can start there. Uh, but any good bylaw that we will craft on your behalf really starts with and applicability. And that's the conversation we'd like to hear from the board members tonight. Yeah. For the benefit of the public, Pat, maybe it would be good if we read um, read this, uh, uh, these, the mm -hmm. item number one, purpose, and number two, applicability, and then we go from there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, these are, these are kickoffs, these are suggestions for you to start your conversation with right. regards to this issue. So feel free to amend or whatever. Okay, so for the benefit of people who are here and for the public who are listening, number one on our agenda to discuss is the purpose, and there are two <coughs> sections under that. A is to provide standards for the placement, design, construction, monitoring, modification, and removal. And B is protect the public and minimize negative impacts. So that forms the broader purpose of why we're doing what we're doing. Number two is the applicability. One of those is who may apply, and if they do apply, how do they do so? A, may turbines be the principal land use on a lot? Must turbines be an accessory land use on the lot? Specifically define principal slash accessory land use in reference to turbines and appurtenances. B, are turbines allowed town-wide? Are turbines only allowed in certain zoning districts? Are small turbines allowed in more zoning districts where larger turbines are not? C, are turbines a by right land use or a special permit land use? So those are the two segments that we are going to start off with tonight to form the types of, of um, answers that we're looking for in the formation of our bylaw that we're currently starting to put together. And as Brian said, we maybe can approach it more readily with the applicability <coughs> questions. They're more direct um, because when we're then looking at providing standards for placement, design, construction, monitoring, uh, modification and removal, a lot of that comes out of the elements in the second a segment of this, of the purpose. Um, not necessarily removal. My own personal thought is that we really do have to have that in any bylaw we have because the turbines generally seem to have about a 20 year lifespan and whoever owns it suddenly folds up and runs away. We're left with a turbine that becomes derelict. So we've got to definitely protect the town from that potential eventuality. Um, we may wish to put monitoring and maintenance into the bylaw. I don't know whether we want to put that in. I'm just forming some of this so you all can bounce off of that. And these are things I picked up by reading a lot of information. Um, the placement is vital to what we're going to be looking at here too. Do we want to have zones? Do we want to have them all over town? Do we want to have them in certain zoning districts? That's the kind of thing that we'd be looking at as well. So with that as a kickoff, I think unless you want me to continue rattling on, I'd love to get some input from all of you. 
Yeah, Jim. <coughs> you wanted me to take over at least. Sure, Is that okay. please. Okay. I'm pretty good with number one. I don't have any comments on that. Uh, I think we have a lot of work to do on number two, especially uh, I, I would like to understand, you know, may turbines be the principal land use or, or, or must they be accessory? I wouldn't want to think now, if we make a turbine that <coughs> uh, could go in a residential zone in all districts and become the principal land use, could we put a garage in a residential zone without a house attached to it? Could somebody just start parking cars there? Could we put solar panels in a, in a zone? So could you be in a residential neighborhood and then have a wind turbine on one lot, a garage on the other? Are, the, are we really changing our zoning so much that we're going to allow energy type products or things to become the purpose, the, um, the principal use on it and not <clears throat> an accessory to an existing building, which I think is a major change in the way our zoning laws read. And I wanted, I'd want to really talk about that before we move down that road. And as far as uh, town-wide, uh, that's something we need to discuss, but I definitely think on C, they're not, they shouldn't be a buy right. It should be a special permit, and it should be studied very carefully. Those are my comments. Okay, Bob. Uh, I saw that uh, A, uh, about the principal use as something that, that we're looking at uh, wind farms, potentially, anywhere. So that's something that uh, I think we need to hammer out. Um, I do agree with Jim that they should be a special permit uh, use. And um, do we want them to be wide? And what is the relationship between the larger turbines and the smaller turbines? And you and I had a, 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 a little comment uh, before the meeting about the performance standards for smaller turbines and um, how restrictive just the land can be on things like that. And do we allow somebody to just put a turbine up because they want to put a turbine up? And we know that it isn't going to work. Um, so there's some issues with the small turbines as well. Well, well under, under purpose, I, li I like the things that are there, but I'm just wondering if under purpose we shouldn't also have some kind of a positive statement in there that says uh, wind energy systems could contribute to the energy requirements of the town. Um, because that's what they're there for. So if I were to add anything to purpose, it would be uh, like, like a C, which would mean uh, something to the effect of what, what I just said. Uh, the purpose would be to, so I guess, how about the word supplement? Um, Climate action plan. Su supplement and energy um, sources for the town. How's that? Um, I also like, uh, I also like, um, <clears throat> I also, um, like the fact that, um, if, if we're going to have, like, um, Bob mentioned the wind farm and Jim also mentioned, uh, solar, I would, you know, I would think that if you had a wind farm, uh, you could also have solar on the same property. Because the because the wind turbines go up and the solar panels go out, so I would I would think that um, saying that wind turbines should be the principal land use on a lot might be too restrictive, and I also agree definitely that a special permit should be required. Um, as far as the discussion of where we're going to place them, I'm still. Uh, <clears throat> open to listening to what the rest of the board um, has to say about that and also our staff. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the purpose, I, th I think those, those pretty much are good as main, ca main actions. Uh, and the applicability, the, the turbine's uh, principal land use is definitely hinged on, I, I think, a special permit for the land use. I think we're going to have to really look at the special permits as a lot of criteria because as 
I wouldn't want people to just put turbines in residential neighborhoods, but to restrict, if you have an undeveloped piece of, say, light industrial land or commercial land that they didn't want to use, why could they not, if it fit, use that for wind farm, wind energy? So I wouldn't want to see it principal land use only because <coughs> technically you could still use wind turbines elsewhere, but the criteria for a special permit is going to have to take, I think, a lot of a lot of research so we cover everything and protect the siting and, and, and the placement of, of those and where they go. So I don't think it probably would ever happen, but if you had industrial land and you wanted to put a permit, I mean put up a uh, turbine as a primary use, would that be acceptable? Probably wouldn't happen anyway, but it seems like with industrial land you should be able to do any type of business venture that you choose. And uh, as far as other zones, I guess the first one that comes to mind would be a historic district. You would probably not want to approve them there. Just wouldn't blend in. Um, I guess it's uh, it's all site specific. I guess. Okay. Um, a long way to go. So uh, now I'll weigh in. If you have turbines as the principal land use on a lot, you realize that you will be uh, permitting a power plant because if that is the principal and or only use on the land, on the land, that is the only reason for it to be there. So you're permitting a power plant. Um, when you get into that, well, let me go on to must turbines be an accessory land use on the lot. We have to more closely define what we mean by accessory. Because as we know, there is a turbine that was put in as an accessory, and I think they use only 5% of the power coming off of it. Is that truly accessory, or is that a power plant? Do we want to put that the um, owner, operator, user of the land shall uh, use no less than 50% of the power provided, so only 50% or only they must use 75% of the power for their own use. So that in that case, only 50% or 25% can be sold into the grid. Otherwise, are we then permitting <coughs> a commercial power plant principally as the principal use? And is that what we're really doing by the turbine bylaw? So you have to really be careful with the answer to that question. Um, also, turbines, that are going to be a power plant are going to be the very large ones, as large as we have out there at the uh, sewage treatment plant or potentially <coughs> even larger, because otherwise it probably is not economically feasible to put something as a principal land use unless it's large enough to really provide <coughs> sufficient power to do so. So I think that has to be put into our equation. Um, So that, we have to carefully look at, that's part of, the, of a major definition that we're looking at here as to whether it's accessory or principal, and the sizing issue. And that I keep asking, okay, they say, hmm, well, large ones seem to be the trouble. Small ones don't appear to be any kind of a problem. How do you define it? Mm -hmm. We've got the 10 kilowatt turbines that don't seem to be a problem. We've got the 100 kilowatt turbine that seems to be somewhat of a problem. And we've got the 1.6 megawatt, I believe, turbines that are creating a lot of problems for people. The 10 kilowatt turbines, we've got mm, three or four of those, I think. As far as I know, no one has ever complained about those. So one of the things that we need to look at is defining what we mean by small and large and what we want to allow here. Are we going to define it by kilowatt? Are we going to define it by the sound? That isn't in here. So that's something we're going to have to deal with. And is it sound where? Sound at the edge of the property that the turbine is on? Is it sound at the edge of the closest residential property? Um, 
are we going to break sound down or are we going to do DBA as the state has? And it doesn't break it down at this point as to what we can look at. So then we're looking into what kind of sounds are we going to allow and how loud are they going to be? Are we going to allow that sound as um, 10 over the ambient background, which every time you add another noise in becomes a new ambient background, as my understanding. And then every time you put something else in, it becomes 10 dBA higher, perhaps. That can be allowed. Huge question there. Or are we going to keep it at A standard and not allow? Because we're dealing with a different animal here than the state had in their original Law, uh, bylaws that govern this sort of thing. Are turbines allowed town wide? That's a big one too. <coughs> because to determine that, I think we have to determine setbacks. And then we have to start looking at where those setbacks are possible to, to tell you where are we going to do it? Are we going to have zoning areas or, or overlay areas where turbines are going to be allowed or are they going to be allowed in ag a and ag double a or are they going to be allowed in industrial areas well you may not be able to have the setbacks in those areas that you really want so that becomes really complex there as to what we're looking at so I would posit that we have to look at sound <coughs> setbacks in relationship to the sound uh, shadow flicker and ice throw, which are what we identified as potential problems. Um, and as I said, we have to define what we mean by small, large, medium. And as far as I know, they're not really satisfactorily defined anywhere. We have, as I said, the, the 10, the 100, and the 1.6 megawatt here. But I believe there are also 250, 400 kilowatts, 660, uh, which Hull has. So how are we going to look at that? Are we going to look at it with what is the available land that we have versus the sound versus the setbacks? But to my mind, that's a big question that has to be answered before we can start plotting it. And I think, are turbines a by right land use? No, I don't think they can be. Not with what we've experienced here. I think we'd be derelict in our duty to allow it to be by right. One thing I don't know is if it becomes a special permit land use, does the planning board, can the planning board keep that permitting? Or does the ZBA automatically get a special permit? Doesn't automatically get it. No. So we could keep it right here within the planning board if we chose to do so. And from what I'm hearing tonight, <coughs> everybody seems to think, oh yeah, it's got to be by special permit. And then when we say by special permit, we have to very carefully outline the things that we're going to look at under that special permit so that we really define further what we're even looking at. So you go on down to definitions, and we're not there tonight. Um, that's my two cents. And now more. Um, I think we're hitting all on the same points. I think that the... Uh, that not being a by right and, and possibly <clears throat> defining, defining uh, this is rehashing a little bit what you said, but have it more focused, certain zo um, zoning districts where they're allowed and when they're not. I, I, I was not, I'm not concerned about an industrial area having one. I'm concerned about all the other setback issues we have, but as far as being, uh, but by a special permit and also graduating in size. <coughs> Uh, on, on where they're allowed in some in some areas like residential not allowed at all not even opportunity for a special permit I think we have to have some of those areas like in every zoning district it tells you what you can get a special permit for and what you can't it just doesn't open up the door to get a special permit for everything I think that's going to be part of our job to, to make that I, I just want to comment on one thing that you just said that makes a lot of sense what you said about not a residential zone is is right on 
But you know, one thing that we need to look at too is, is we have some developments that aren't zoned residential. They're A and AA. We, so that's something we definitely better look at because we could create a bylaw and technically somebody could put one in one of those. Well, that's why I said we have yeah. to be careful about having that discussion. We have neighborhoods that are mm -hmm. AA mm -hmm. that have hundreds of houses in them. And those can be controlled by setback. No, I'm just saying, so that that's in. something we definitely have to look at. But we have to decide whether we want uh, agriculturally zoned areas to have these by special permit, and if so, by special permit, what size? You know, you know I think that's two discussions. If we decide we would like to have some wind turbines in agricultural areas and smaller ones, and they fit, but maybe not the industrial ones. So those are the discussions we need to have. And for a while, it's going to take us a bit to get through all that. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Uh, just a comment about mm -hmm. the uh, 10 kW turbines from the small wind forum that I attended last week. Uh, they wouldn't even recommend anybody putting one in. They said solar is much more mm -hmm. bang for your buck uh, if you're going to put a 10 uh, kW system in. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, this is another part Bob and I was just talking very briefly about what he attended is that and I remember Megan Amsler having said this too, that turbines have to be a certain height before they're the least bit efficient. They don't catch enough wind right. to put them in. And the 10 kWs tend not to be really tall. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing we have to contemplate here. Um, I, think what, I think another thing we're going to, we should take advantage of is example bylaws. And there are a number of them out there. However, one thing we have to do is, I think, to, um, define this sufficiently that it doesn't become a 60-page bylaw like one I've seen. I mean, how long do we want this to be? Do we want it to take over our bylaw booklet, too? How do we define it sufficiently and succinctly enough that it really is useful? <coughs> well, um, I remember um, Bob your comments uh, a while back trying to limit the size of these by the amount of energy they produce. And <clears throat> originally I thought that made a lot of sense, but then I thought that if, as technology evolves, um, smaller <laughs> turbines might be able to generate as much or more energy than they do, than the bigger ones do now. So, so, so uh, I think I think I'm, 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 I'm leaning more towards physical size of these things rather than <clears throat> their energy output. And then, uh, uh, how, what's the uh, output of the one at the high school? Ten. Ten. Uh, that, that's quite a ways up in the air. And, and I watched it the other day, and it was, I thought it was going to take off. Yeah, and that's turbulence it, at steel. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's not really generating. It's not okay. No, it's, it's improperly cited. Okay. Well, anyway, I um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking forward to take advantage of your attending that conference, which I couldn't, uh, which I couldn't, and maybe you'll be able to expound on that. Uh, obviously, you're <clears throat> you're saying that solar panels make more sense. Obviously, solar panels require more area, mm -hmm. whereas turbines require a fairly small amount of area. Mm -hmm. And they're more affected by geography uh, as far turbines. as turbines are yeah. because of uh, hills and other obstacles and right. uh, other uh, land features and things like that. Um, I know some of us have been kind of hanging our hat on the technology is going to change and make, make things better. And we've talked about the helical ones and for, they've got one up at uh, Mass Maritime and it has yet to generate its capacity in six months. Uh, it's a uh, 10 kW, uh, I believe it's a 10 kW uh, turbine. It hasn't generated 10 kilowatts of electricity in six months. Does this thing look like a box kite yeah. in, the, yeah. in the vertical yeah. position? Yeah, they say they're absolutely a disaster. I saw one out west recently, and yeah. I, I, I said, gee, I've never, I'd never seen one before. And it was turning, yeah. but I mean, I don't know yeah. what it was generating. But it, but it doesn't, it hasn't generated uh, anything. Mm -hmm. And the word is that uh, bigger is, is it in order for turbines to be more efficient and to generate the power that people want, they're going to get bigger, not smaller. So taller, bigger blades. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why 
I think that a lot of our um, applicability and other issues may be understood more if we decide and come up with a set standard. We're going to have to put a setback standard. I mean, we don't have to, you know, put it back, you know, three miles or, or whatever, but we, I think the, one of the first things that I think we need to do is figure out what we want to start our figurations on. Numbers for a setback. Do we want to use the Cape Cod Commission's, what do they do, a 10 <coughs> times or something like ten that? 10 times the rotor diameter. I mean, do we want to look at what that is <coughs> or... Well, is it, if 10 times the rotor, what is the rotor on the ones, the wind one and wind two? Aren't those 400 feet or no, that's 360? Total that's okay. total 285. 285? Okay. So that'd be like 2,900 feet. So yeah. something like that. Maybe should. we do in certain instances then. Maybe that's valid. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, but we have to have some standard to even start and to figure out where we want to go from there. Is that enough? Is it too much? Is it... I think, that, I think that's a good one. We should test that logic. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a, that's one that's out there. Some, you know, somebody's laid it out. We should take a look at it. Because by using that, we can actually throw your setbacks. Well, that is never going to fit in a residential area, 2,800 feet, when that, or even if there's one 100, that's, you know, what, 3,000 or 1,000 feet. So what would they do with 100? That would get us a lot of these questions answered mm -hmm. if we came up with a standard setback that we think we could use. Standard setback, but also what one of the primary complaint areas from the residents is noise. Um, and it's not only just a certain DBA, it's a quality of noise. So now we're getting into how much are we going to allow? Is it going to be DBA? DBA? Right. Is it going to be up to the 40 dBA? And I would suggest that no, it shouldn't be that we currently have allowed because the wind varies. And when are you going to measure it to determine? <coughs> but if we pick one thing, that if we pick a setback, then we could look for research as to what type of dBAs are projected at this range of setback by turbines. So we'd have something to go because there's no way we're going to be able to just pick one turbine may have different noise from a difference. So if we don't start with a setback, we're, we're just kind of... I think we need both of yeah. equal weight. Yeah. The, the sound uh, measurement was a question I had asked. Where do they measure it from? And I couldn't get an answer. You can't. Um, so it's... Brian. I just want to get you a little bit back on track a little bit. All these are, you know, performance standards mm -hmm. and levels of detail, I think. Once you answer some very fundamental questions, of course, we'll be doing for you. But what I'd like to really hear or, or from the board and maybe focus your discussion a bit more back on purpose and, and the whys is, so far what I'm hearing from the board is that this is a, a land use you want to allow in the community. I think you really need to go back to that fundamental question uh, before you guys into the, all those types of, of detailed questions that you've started to stray off into. <coughs> is it the purpose of this bylaw, <coughs> that, or is the policy of this board, to introduce this land use into the community? Whether it's 10 kilowatt, 660, 1.65, 2 megs, whatever it might be. But that's the kind of fundamental policy question we need to start thinking about or talking about. And all that will kind of drift, all the other stuff will drift down. All those detailed, all those setback type issues. And if there's a land use you want in the community, then we'll start getting into should it be a principal land use or an ex only accessory? Uh, what level of regulatory control or scrutiny do you want to subject them to? Special permits or site plan reviews by right? That's the type of fundamental questions I think the board needs to start on. And I know it's not easy. <laughs> I think you need to start talking about it. Okay, well, whether we want to allow them or not in the community, it's too late. The barn door has been closed yeah, after I mean, that. That's not an option for us. They have to be allowed. Yeah. We're not at a board in any position to say we're not allowing them in the community. That's not our position. So that isn't even a question here. We just have to figure out how we're going to protect. C is the biggest thing, protect the public and minimize negative impacts. That's it for our purpose. I mean, they're here. We just have to... Mm -hmm. figure out so we don't have a problem like we had before. Well, not only 
that, but I think maybe we don't want to allow certain types that are already here, but maybe we want to allow the 10 kilowatt or the 100 kilowatt. And so the basic question that Brian is asking is, do we want to say, nope, no more, that ends it right there? <coughs> or do we want to say, yeah, but we want to be a little bit more discerning about what we want to allow. Do we want to allow the 10 kilowatt that might service a home very nicely? Or maybe a small business? Or the 100 kilowatt that obviously is servicing a smaller business? Do we want to allow those? So I guess I get want to say, okay, what's your feeling tonight? And do you have a feeling as to what we might want to allow, what size? I don't think they should be banned outright, because right? even looking at town property, you have the Augusta property, you have the uh, golf course, I and mean, who knows what's going to happen out there. Maybe whatever goes out there could have a, a turbine out there to help generate electricity. So uh, I don't think we should uh, just say absolutely no more. I think we have to look at uh, the zoning, we have to look at places in town where they may be applicable, and kind of base some of our uh, thoughts on that, whether when we stack it into the minutiae of what do we allow, I think uh, we do need to look at where they can possibly go and what types of zones would we not want to see them in versus what type of zones we wouldn't mind seeing them going. Yeah, and I think there could be changes in technology too, so we need to be more adaptive, I think, to develop standards as, as, as we're talking <coughs> about in A is important, but to rule them out, right? No, I, I, you know, who knows what they come up with, but I think they have to be set back at certain heights, they have to perform at certain noise levels, not take away people's uh, property rights. Uh, they may come up with a turbine or some other function that can solve all those problems in the future, so we don't have to rewrite it. So, I mean, I, I think we can find a way to, to make them fit in, in some areas of the top. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um. A noiseless, transparent turban? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm for that. Okay. But, but I, I, I agree. Don't leave the fairy wand. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, no, I, I, I would not want to <clears throat> eliminate, uh, eliminate their, the possibility of wind turbines in town. Um, I think there's, I'm hoping that. Um, that the technology, um, <clears throat> it, it, the current technology would allow the installation of some in an appropriate place mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that the fossil fuel uh, issues are just too detrimental um, to our health and, and, and to a lot of other things. So I'm, I'm keeping my mind open for the use of wind turbines in Falmouth. <clears throat> I, I think the biggest thing is height restrictions. And I, I think that's not so much, like Bob has said, they're going to get bigger. I think we need to have allow turbines, but I think with setbacks and height restrictions, not so much kilowatts or megawatts because the technology may change and a 100-foot turbine may do what a 300-foot turbine does in the future. And I would hate to limit that. And so uh, I'm in favor of looking at the Cape Cod Commission's guidelines and <coughs> seeing how that would work in Falmouth. And I guess we have to decide, first of all, what zoning areas are going to be able to consider it. Uh, historically, they're used in agricultural areas to supplement farms that are struggling. I don't know how many farms we have that would be interested to use it, and if there's enough land on them to do it. And uh, industrial properties also should be considered. And I don't know if the business districts can <coughs> take them. But I guess that's the first thing we have to decide is what zoning can they go in at all, and then how do they fit there. Well, I, I think Doug points out a, a good, uh, a good scenario. If in in the farming, if you take farming and you put solar in there, then you take a lot of your land out of production because it takes the area is consumed by the 
by the panels. Whereas if you have a wind turbine, um, you don't take so much land out of production. Well, and they, you have the transparent solar panels. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. There, granted, we have a minimum number of farms in town anymore, but we've been trying, we have an agricultural committee, I believe, in town, and uh, it's, it's, it's trying to keep agricultural land in production for agriculture and not being developed for housing. Now, now bringing that up, <coughs> in order to be considered a farm in Massachusetts, you need to farm five acres. So if someone has five and a half acres, a half acre for the house, if that's in a particular area, uh, do we allow a turbine for their use on the farm? And let's say it's in uh, a double A or uh, an RC, or something, do we, you know, we need to consider that as well. Right. So now what I'm hearing is that the the fundamental question of allowing this land use in the community seems to be uh, decided. Then when you go back to our purpose now and the overarching policy guidance to us is that if this is to be a land use allowed at all, then this bylaw is to be structured in such a fashion to protect the public and minimize negative impact. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we would offer you the sufficient amount of standards for placement, design, and construction, taking into account such items such as noise, sound. That's the type of policy I want to hear from the board tonight, that yes, they are allowed. And the overarching guiding principle of this bylaw will be the protection of the public health and welfare. That's the type of things we need to hear from you. So then we'll start <coughs> step by step by step go down the list. That's the type of discussion. So, so Brian, what you're saying, number one, do you really think that A should have been, do we want wind turbines at all? And then B, if so, then provide standards. I mean, that seems well, to be what you're saying. I don't want to. You guys are the board. I'm no, but you were talking about your a thing. purpose that isn't written here. Well. <laughs> but implied, and I was just trying to get I, to that point. I was trying to get you to that point without having well, to say it. Now that you're there, okay, now we're going to get into some of the fundamental guiding policies that will structure this bylaw that will regulate the land use you'd like to introduce into the community. And what I'm hearing here tonight at least is that you, you want a bylaw that whose purpose is to protect the public and minimize negative impacts. And then we'll get into doing that by who can apply, what are the applicabilities. That's, you see what I'm saying? So let's just say for the sake of argument, yes, it's a land use that uh, the, the planning board as a policy wants to allow in the community. Uh, the overarching principle is to, overarching purpose is to design a bylaw that protects the public's uh, interests and minimizes negative impacts. Then we perhaps have a, a fuller discussion about some of the particulars who are under applicability. There will be private turbines or just public turbines when we get into things such as who may apply. Do you want private turbines? I guess yes. The answer is yes, I'm hearing, and, and public ones too. And what we're also hearing uh, from you tonight, as you started your discussion with regards to a principal use of the land or an accessory use of the land, you're kind of, you're getting there, but do you want this bylaw structure in such a fashion that Today's bylaw it has to be an accessory use. An accessory use typically is up to 30% of a building or 30% of a lot. A correlate would be a, a, a wind turbine allowed only as an accessory use that must use 70% of its power for the principal use on site. Those are the types of you know policy questions I think the board needs to discuss under under two. It's not easy stuff, folks. I understand. It's more, uh, it's not like a little subdivision plan to eliminate a portion of a right of way. These are some of the guiding principles I think you need to just think a little more cosmically about, not to worry about uh, some of the minutiae yet. Hey, we I hope that helps. I don't, 
I don't agree with the uh, restricting the the use to you know you have to use all the electricity on site because that's so restrictive. As long as it doesn't bother anyone and it's meeting, <coughs> meeting the setbacks and guidelines, why shouldn't they be able to you know m make a profit from their business venture? Because you'd have to do the same thing for people's solar panels as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? Why, why, you know, you just that's in effect right now. Yeah. I know people with solar panels whose whose meter goes the other way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. So that's that's not. Yeah. If, you, if you've got the room on your roof to do it, why yeah. not? Right. And it helps you offset the cost because uh, there's an investment involved here, <laughs> huge. Right. And we already have <clears throat> situations where, uh, say, for contractors, yeah, you need uh, X number of acres. Uh, so we already have zoning that requires a certain amount of acreage in order to do a particular thing. Mm -hmm. So if uh, your, your property meets the requirements for the acreage that uh, would allow a certain size turbine or whatever, I think that's something that uh, could work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe like, uh, it looks, sounds like everybody's kind of wanting it to be an accessory use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe there could be exceptions. Mm -hmm. And in an exception be something like if there was an undeveloped industrial piece of land mm -hmm. that somebody could put a turbine on that maybe that could be an exception mm -hmm. for unaccessory use you know what I mean it, it is an industrial use so I yeah. think that, that makes it easier yeah. yeah or even on public use property mm -hmm. and another question <coughs> is um, if we're going to make this a special permit requirement is that also include public use property absolutely <laughs> right. absolutely <laughs> Well, do we want to, as an accessory use, define? I said, what we're hearing from you tonight is that there's a, there's a, the board is leaning towards along these, as it, I have my little notes, it's more accessory, with perhaps a, an exception to the general rule somewhere down the road. But, you know, we flesh that all out, but let's just keep it at the old policy level here. So you're, you're thinking more along accessory with the general exception. And how do you define an accessory? Um, say, for instance, you have a business that costs uh, $300,000 and a turbine that costs a million. Is it still an accessory? Does it go by a dollar value? Or yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll provide that appropriate standard. If, if I have a, is it, the key words are customarily incidental there, too. So if I have a, uh, a barn and I'm raising whatever it might be, uh, sheep. Customarily incidental to that barn raising sheep is in a, a, a 1.6 megawatt turbine. Uh, it might be something else. So we, we'll, we'll get those details for you. Uh, but well, what I'm hearing is the barn is leading towards this as an accessory use of, a, of something allowed in town. Uh, <coughs> or the land use that would be a permitted in town. That might be, uh, uh, well, we're, looking, we're leaning towards accessory and uh, special we, permit use. And I, I got that loud and clear. <laughs> um, perhaps you just want to expand a little bit more on, on B. Uh, Question for Brian? There you go. Aren't just about anything uh, that's a little bit. Well, we say it's an accessory use, but that, there's a lot of things in town where the accessory use is a secondary use of the property. That's pretty much the way we zone things. With this is the primary uses here, and oh, and you can have these as accessories. I mean, that's just been our general pattern, isn't it? With the way we write the zoning. Right. Most, most residential zones have a particular principal uses, right? Uh, and then they might have accessory uses, uh, a garage, a three-car garage. Or uh, something that's customarily incidental to one of the principal uses that's allowed as a matter of right. Uh, but isn't it the same in but, agricultural? But, but in some, but in some zones, you do allow more than one principal use. In business zones and industrial zones, you can have more than one principal use. I can have a, a sawmill, and I might have a, a trucking company next on the same lot that takes this, takes the wood away. Uh, so we'll make sure that it's structured in such a fashion that you know. This must be accessory to one principle. Okay. 
You know, what I was hearing is that Brian would like a little bit more definition on B <coughs> under this. Are turbines allowed town-wide? And what I was hearing is, no, they're not, but we're not quite sure yet where we'd like to see them um, as per zoning district or lot size or what. We're not quite sure about that yet. Um, and are small turbines allowed in more zoning districts where larger turbines are not? We're going to have small and larger defined satisfactorily to do that. And will it make any difference? Or are we looking at setbacks, which has to do with lot size? And are we, list, are we more concerned with the sound emanating from these turbines, regardless of what their size is? Um, are we concerned with Somebody said, we don't want them in historic districts. End of story. Um, do we want them close to the shoreline that might be considered, you know, we do have our bylaws that uh, you can't interfere with somebody's enjoyment or, or shadowing of their property. Or um, in this case, it could be the scenic values. Do we want them, say, at the knob, you know? It's a very windy place. Mm -hmm. um, so do we want to protect our scenic values by not allowing them in certain places, say a certain distance from the shoreline, so mm. that we're protecting our, <coughs> our tourist industry here? That was something I brought up on the very first discussion. Mm -hmm. we not only are we talking about land, we should also be talking about water. Mm -hmm. So I'd open it to that right now to give Brian some uh, feedback on what we think about those things that I just mentioned. Anybody want to say anything in regard to that? Well, you know, getting back to allowing them town wide, if we do look at certain lot sizes uh, that would allow it, uh, let's say somebody has all the criteria that would allow somebody in a particular zone, do we discriminate against somebody that just doesn't have that zone designation? Mm -hmm. Just because they don't live in that particular part of town. And I think under a special permit, we would have to have findings that it is not detrimental detrimental to the scenic vistas of the area. I mean, that would be part of the special permit process, mm -hmm. that we would have to have a finding that it, that it doesn't impact those areas. And if it did, it wouldn't get the special permit. Mm -hmm. that, that would be one of the steps. Please. If I could just for a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, say cell towers, telephone t cell towers, or allowed town line by special permits with some criteria. Is that, is that the type of model you envision here? Or are you envisioning something different that's district specific? At this point in time. Are they allowed on any zone property as well? Any zone property. But we have, that's a special permit because the height restriction. <coughs> Anything over 50 feet needs a special permit. That's the type of policy guidance we're looking at. Okay, good question. Now, isn't that, but in part of finding that special permit, it, don't they have to prove that it's not going to be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood? Isn't that part of the criteria? That, that, that's a permit level decision. What I'm looking for is a policy level decision. Okay. Do you envision this type of land use that you think is a, is a lawful in the community? Obviously, it's by special permit, I'm hearing. Um, but are you envisioning this more in terms of restricting them to specific districts or allowing them, it's like a cell phone tower. Uh, you can have them in, in ag zones or on Tom Landers Road. Uh, Mr. Cavosa has one of uh, his contractors there, I double I. Uh, I think there's one down there, Mr. Allaby's property is on Industrial on Fresh Pond Road. Uh, there's another one up on Sandwich Road. Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know if there's any RC zones, but they're specifically allowed town that, that, that level of policy decision is something they think the board needs to contemplate. Okay. And again, these are not final decisions. I'd like to get the board's um, pretty efficient. From, from thinking. like Brian bringing that up, I was I was looking at that one. I don't think we can say it couldn't be town wide because our zones and zoning is so broken up. We have, you know, this type of zoning in East Falmouth and North Falmouth and West Falmouth and 
I think it has to be town wide, but how we need to control it is with our special permit criteria and setbacks. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a problem not putting them in a residential zone. <clears throat> As, you know, residential zones are simple. The, use, the uses are, are, are residents, that's the prime use. It's, they're, 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 everything else is spelled out, but to have it as a, <coughs> I, I just don't think they belong in residential zoned areas. Remember, ag zone areas in this town are principally well, used for I residential. No, I understand that. That still leaves a lot of land available to them. I'm just saying I can find one district where I can make the argument no. that it doesn't belong. Historic districts. Not right. No. Uh, but, but I'm saying uh, we could make an argument with a special <coughs> permit in certain other zones. I won't say agriculture or anything. I'm open to discussing all those. But I, I just don't see it as a use in a residential zone. That's an industrial use. Mm -hmm. See, that's a pretty easy decision to say no. Well, principally, they also have smaller lots. Yes. yes. And they will have smaller lots well, in the future. Let's see if, if... I mean, they'll build, if they're built out. I'll be the devil's advocate here. Say somebody is in, has a, has a two-acre parcel, and there's no neighbors, and they're abutted by else, and they want to put a little 10-kilowatt, you know, 50-foot tower. Right. You would just have said that they couldn't do it. Well, maybe you can find a, a small one, right? I, I'm just saying, so by not <coughs> allowing it... Well, you, you can put a cap on the size. I don't know what... We're all saying that the little ones don't work, but if you're not going to notice it from the distance... But, but by saying it's not town-wide, you've just taken... By size. That. I, I was thinking more of the big... But, like he said, we got to look at the whole thing. It, yeah. And before we say that, we should consider that... The huge wind resource is all along the coast there from Sipuwisa to Woods Hole, and that's all residential. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's some big lots over there too, and there could be some people that would be interested in doing it. It, yeah, it could be private citizens that have more than enough, and it would never impact anybody. But if you make it that it's not town wide, you've just taken that out. I mean, The only district I would restrict them in is, is an historic district. That's the only one that I would absolutely say I don't think I'd, I'd ever approve one in there. Otherwise, I'm, I'm up for any zone district we have as long as it can meet the criteria of a special permit. Right. <clears throat> I, I, I've heard the board. I'm good for that. Okay. I don't want to prolong this. Anybody else? Anything else? Do you have enough for tonight, or do you want us to go a little further? How do you feel? I'm, I'm paid to be here. How do you folks, you, you make that well, decision. I don't know if I have anything else that's like. Right now, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like. Yeah. A, Good start. Purpose is, is sure. we need more of the purpose so we can figure out <coughs> those other options, mm -hmm. I think. Or more of the. Well, I'm, I'm thinking as a town, we are so much further ahead than others that don't have any experience at all with turbines. We've got various different sizes. We have various different complaint levels. And so we have experience to help us create this bylaw. Um, so I think we're a lot further ahead than other communities. But I would also say that we need to look at other bylaws to see what they've done, too. And we do have, I think you have a number of those up in the planning office in the um, notebook. So I think that would be of infinite help to us in looking at how other towns have used the bylaws. I um, have what is in their bylaws. Not that we want to follow those, but it gives us some indication as to how other towns have created <coughs> bylaws. And the Cape Cod Commission, they just have a, a few things that we might be able to hang our hat on. Maybe they're not appropriate for us. So I guess I would ask before we bring up another discussion, if we look more sure. at other example bylaws. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that point. Uh, the board should remember that this is an iterative process. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit cumulative, too. We, we can always go back as you progress in your discussions. You can always go back to your purpose. You can always go back to your applicability as you move down your list of items here. But give some real thought to what, we, what you initially discussed here tonight. Uh, because this was your opening salvo, as we say. Um, we'll go back and to 
what you have guided our thinking on so far. Um, and give some thought to the, your, your purpose uh, a little bit more. We'll discuss it some more perhaps at our next meeting, which would be the 10th of April, uh, because town meeting is next week. At that meeting, I, I would like to actually do uh, some views or prior to that meeting. Uh, I would like to take some, the board out to view some of these facilities. Uh, so if you can let Joyce know if you're available on the 10th <coughs> for the meeting, I thought it might make some sense. We can take a little tour of some of the uh, facilities that are here in this community. And perhaps in the future, we can take a look uh, on the Everett Cape at some others. But I think it's important for you to get scale and perspective uh, as you further your discussions uh, down the road. But uh, you did okay today. You did okay. But you know, we need to really start really thinking hard about some of the fundamental, the fundamentals, and leave them, leave the driving the bus to us uh, on some of the details. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Mm. Next item on the agenda is a discussion. <coughs> concerning the water, sewer, and energy elements of the local comprehensive plan. You should have probably run this whole meeting tonight, Pat. <laughs> I was going to say she's up again. I was almost going to say that a minute ago. I know for the benefit of the public, Pat is also spearheading the um, revision of the local comprehensive plan with the help of uh, Bob Leary and Jim Fox. So uh, we <clears throat> we have. Ooh, let's see. Well, the first thing I have here is the uh, is that everybody has seen the narrative. I believe the um, dated March twenty first uh, concerning um, the uh, water and wastewater um, overview. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple of questions about that, um, and I'm not sure if anybody else does, but, do. but uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a, I'm not just sure whether this is just a statement, uh, of, uh, from your subcommittee here about the situation or whether or not this is to be incorporated in the uh, in any in, in the local comprehensive plan maybe i should give you an introduction good first okay do you have another copy of that <coughs> i don't okay. i printed it off I print the uh, next one. oh good okay thank you very can you much can you guys share here i was unable to print what i got oh sent. dear well, first of all, I, I would like to tell you that the one called Energy for the Future is the most fully developed because over time we had had the public meetings and so we got the most input on that before things <coughs> kind of fell apart as far as getting a lot of public input goes. So you will see that we have the goal statement on one page, we have policies, and we have action items. Uh, <coughs> the goal statement is just that first paragraph up at the top there. I didn't make it all fancy. And then you have the narrative that is somewhat of an introduction to what follows. Um, so that's probably the most complete, I would say, at this point in time. And we'd be looking for any input you have before we go to a public hearing on this, before it then goes to town meeting. And that's the process that we follow with the comprehensive plan town meeting only looks at the goals and policies. That is what they vote. The rest of it is part of what forms the entirety of the local comprehensive plan. The narrative attempts to make some sense out of the more outlined part of it. So I'm reasonably sure you probably all haven't had a chance to look at it or maybe you have to make comments have well, I think we, we we three have but 
Okay. Yeah. And I, the energy one I've looked at, because I was a part of the original. Right, you were part of that. So, so I don't know. I, Can we start with that for comments, since it is of the most, the most complete? Do you have any or not? Yeah, I have, I have it in front of me. The only, the only comment it? that I, I wanted to make on that one mm -hmm. is, is you had some things in there, thought it might have been a little micromanaging. Mm -hmm. Did, were we going to take that out? Is that because I remember we, we had talked about some of that before. Is that element like, it was about the uh, lights and the... Uh, yeah, and we haven't looked at that. That's what we'd be looking at for you all to make comments I was thinking on. that that should, maybe that whole thing should just go away. Okay. That, that particular one, just that one, that was it. Uh, replace comment. light switches. Is that what yeah, you're talking with about the, with motion activated switches? And okay, that's in here, isn't it? That's number six. And there was a comment on there. Is that uh, too municipal. micromanaging? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are I mean, some that comments <clears throat> read here that were put in a little bit afterwards, and I would feel I would hope you would feel free to make all the comments you want to rewrite portions of it if you choose to do so. And then we'll take another crack at it before the public hearing. So if you feel like you want to make some comments tonight on it, that's great. If not, if you want to wait until another time to come in and or send your comments to Marlene, it might, might even be a better way of doing it. So that then when we three meet as a committee, <coughs> we can work on incorporating any changes that you come up with. That was the only comment that I had on that one particular one. You had already put a comment in there about, right. you know, is this micromanaging? And I thought maybe maybe it is, but it's I'm yeah. fine either way. If it's in there or it's taken out. Okay. That's the only that's, comment. That's this one. <coughs> Number six there. <coughs> I could go for municipal. Yeah, no, I municipal. Could, I mean, they've done it at the high school. So it's a municipal policy yeah. then. Yeah. And yeah. So... I mean, we can't do it in houses, obviously. So. Um. Well, I have I have a comment. On okay. That. First of all, we need to remember that these are in draft form, and the, the word mm -hmm. draft needs to appear on on the on the, at least the title page of these different things. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. So uh, we really need to be be uh, diligent about that because it is you did put uh, the word draft on the. Uh, water and wastewater page mm -hmm. so uh, that's a nitpick but on on the, um, under policies number one <clears throat> he said the town of Falmouth will provide leadership and set the example in carbon foot, foot footprint reduction and my comment was to whom to whom are we going to provide leadership uh, you know Maybe you just want to change the wording there and just say, we'll, we'll do it. But okay. if you're going to provide leadership, you've got to know who you're going to be providing it to. Okay. Um, and uh, I just got a little, few other little tiny comments, uh, word, word smithing. Okay. That, that is not, no, I'll just, okay, you'll I'll, just, I'll, send I'll, I'll just give it to Marlene. Okay, all right. It's not worth our, our discussing here. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go on to the water and wastewater. Um, the chances are when it comes up before town meeting, this will be split into water and wastewater <coughs> for their vote. Um, because we can anticipate that one may get more discussion than another and we would like to go move ahead as expeditiously as we can with these. So we are combining them into one element because it makes sense to do so. They're inextricably mated, if you will. <coughs> um, now, what you have here for the narrative is an absolute first draft. And so I would appreciate and Marlene would appreciate any input that you can give so that then the committee can take some scissors and some tape and cut and paste and change and do whatever. Um, this again describes our thinking on the goal <coughs> of the policies. Our attempt is to, for each element, get one goal and a number of policies, but a manageable amount of policies. 
because this is water and wastewater, we obviously are going to have to have two separate goals in here. And that's how this is structured, with a, a goal and we have three policies under water and under wastewater. We have another goal and we've got, what, seven? Um, seven or eight bulleted policies. And I really want you to take a good look at that. We met with uh, the DPW, with three people there, had a nice, what was it, maybe a two-hour discussion with them. And out of that discussion and then our further discussion when we convened as a committee came the goals and the policies. And we met with some others also that the wastewater committee that is currently meeting and who am I missing here, Marlene? Yes, Gary Anderson from the financial aspect of it because what we are attempting to do within this is to say we as a town tend to vote things, but then we tend not to see to its long-term maintenance. So we are attempting to put in the policy section that it will become a budget item and it becomes a policy of the town to see to the long-term maintenance of these items. Um, so that explains to you <coughs> that part of the policy that we've put in here. Jim. One of the things we try to do on these policies is to have them be very broad, okay, so that when you look at Falmouth shall develop and protect all the current future drinking water sources, that's a really broad statement. For the next five years, we could have five action items that develop under that, that fit under that. They can go away. We don't have to revise the policy. But we can add more that all fit underneath that broader statement. So we're really trying to think about it from that. So you're going to see some very broad goals that we're, we're trying to have here with the idea that the <coughs> specifically might fit, fit under that. So think about that when you're thinking about what, what you'd like to add. If it fits under there already, then maybe it's going to move down into a, a policy or an action, action item. Yeah. You know, that, that, that we take that and put it in, and those could be dealt with over time and change, change in and out. But the idea that the goals should be broad enough to stay there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. that was, that's our thought process. Yeah. I've said this a number of times, that we look at this as a living document so that we don't have to come back every five or seven years and rewrite the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That is the specific reason that these goals and policies are brought enough. Because every time we rewrite those, we go back to town meeting. And it's the action items that this, the goals and the policies set the tone and the direction. The action items are the actual things that we are looking to have done. When one is done, if it is truly a living document, it goes away and something else takes its place that we've become aware of that needs to be accomplished. Any, at any time, actions can be removed or added to this document. We also are trying to um, get each element of a, to some degree, a uniform size, a workable size. We've got some elements now that are 30, maybe even 40 pages. We've got some that are eight. We are trying to go for probably no more than eight pages per element. That becomes useful. It's not off-putting to the people who look at it and use it as a town. So uh, we've got enough new members that are giving this background again. Um, and we're looking way down the road, 50, even 100. Uh, water mm -hmm. and wastewater are with us forever. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we're looking at. Yeah. And the wastewater plants that we're looking at now are way down the road, 30, 40 years. So we're trying to encompass as much as we can with our today's outlook what might be there that far in the future. So again, does anybody have <coughs> any kinds of um, comments? Yeah, Ralph. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank the three of you for your uh, and, and Marlene, I believe you're working with them on this. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you publicly for this effort because it is not easy. 
and it requires a lot of time. And I just hope that the town appreciates what you're doing here when you're finished. Uh, I have some comments, but I would like to know, first of all, underwater and wastewater, you will be developing action items. Is that correct? There will be action items that, that will that will uh, <clears throat> that, that will come after, just like they did on the, on the energy. So yeah, uh, so you, we you don't have to have those in place to take it to town meeting. No, I understand that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so those could be developed later. Okay, then, then on the on the introduction page there, um, uh, what is the purpose? Where will that will that be included in the local comprehensive plan, or is that just a is that just a a, a, um, a statement of scenario explaining what you have done so far with the water and wastewater elements? No, if as I said, the energy for the future is the most complete. So if you can look no, at that I, as a no, pattern. I, I'm looking at this Yeah, I know here. what you're looking at, but you're asking a question that I'm trying to answer by this. So if you look at this, this is the way we see it being formatted and put into the local comprehensive plan. We have a goal statement, which will in yeah. some way be highlighted. Right. Then we have um, a one-page explanation of what we're trying to accomplish with the policies and the action items the goal, the policies, and the action item. Now, if you put this in the same manner, this may be difficult, the narrative may be difficult to keep within one page because we are um, looking at two rather complex elements that we're combining into one here. Right. Um, so we're attempting to put the same kind of narrative that we have here for the energy ahead of <coughs> the goals for water and wastewater and the policies for water and wastewater. It will be part of the local comprehensive plan document. Okay, I'm looking at the energy for, right. for the future, page one, mm -hmm. and it says at the top, goal statement. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I come over back up to nope, water. Nope. That's, you can't tell the difference. That's the goal statement that one paragraph. Then below it is the narrative. Flip back, one page. Okay, that's the goal statement right, right there. Yeah. This is the narrative. I understand that, okay. but now you have here, under mm -hmm. water and wastewater, you have goal statement, and that's not the same as it, this. It's not the form, it's the same format. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle that when we actually put it in as an element. We originally were thinking of it as potentially two elements. So this could possibly be a goal statement, this, this big page here with no, all of this verbiage? It's, it's a narrative. So there is no narrative for <clears throat> there is no narrative for energy? Yes, that's the narrative. Uh, this part right here. All these little paragraphs here. Are, as the narrative. Okay, yeah. So this is the narrative. Okay. okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to the narrative on the on waste water and wastewater. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure we get the word draft on that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, on the uh, first paragraph, about seven or eight, <clears throat> seven or eight lines down, you make the statement: the water and wastewater element has taken the position that a, multiple, uh, a municipal scale sewer expansion project is the most responsible future course of action. And, and that, is a, that is a question that we really have to discuss as a planning board, I think. Absolutely. Um, so that, that's, 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 a, that's a very definitive and strong statement that I think um, just needs everybody's attention. Then um, in the second paragraph, um, <clears throat> almost three-fourths of the way down, you say, however, about halfway down, however those areas the town not, however those areas of the town, of town, that are not likely to be sewered within the next 20 to 50 years must take, must also take steps to ensure that Little nitrogen and phosphorus as possible is added to the groundwater by utilizing advanced or alternative plumbing and septic systems. 
and I would suggest that you add there and water conservation procedures um, because water conservation it, it contributes to minimizing um, the migration of phosphorus and nitrogen into our estuaries and let's and ponds um, <clears throat> In the very last paragraph, it's, 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 it says in the very second sentence, tax increases, debt exclusions, and rate increases are unpopular. Well, I believe that personally, if my taxes are increased and the debt exclusions are, are justified and rate increases are justified, that they're not unpopular that they're justified by, by saying, as I recall, the, uh, the, uh, the water superintendent uh, was complaining at the last town meeting that <clears throat> he was going broke because he's selling water and people aren't using enough and he didn't know what to do. And I thought the obvious thing to do was to change, and so did a lot of other people, was just raise his rates. Mm -hmm. So for good quality drinking water, go ahead and raise my rates if you're going broke. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the blanket statement that these types of things are unpopular because in my personal opinion, if I'm getting my money's worth, if, if, if I vote for a debt exclusion in town meeting and it provides some benefit for the town, whether I personally benefit from it or not, but it, it helps the infrastructure of the town to remain um, viable. I don't, I don't feel as though that's an unpopular thing. So I would just question that that particular statement. That's all. We can cross it out. No, I, I, <laughs> you, this committee has to decide whether they want to leave that. Uh, that is my opinion. Okay, that's all. I mean, well, I think it's the committee's opinion, too, that <coughs> we need to pay for what we're getting. Yeah, no kidding. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a strong statement. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with what Ralph says. And, and like you said, maybe just line that out. Yeah. You could take that out, and it just it still flows without it being in there. There's but, a lot that will flow yeah. with modification. Honestly, this is a first draft. I understand. Right. No, no. <laughs> when he was mentioned, I was like, yeah, I can see you could take it out. Yeah. It wouldn't affect it. Because I, I think the goal is going to be to consolidate <clears throat> um, some of this. The next time you look at this, I hope we will have a revised. You know, that, that the revision may have gone through even twice over, and the whole of the committee will hack at it, too. Mm -hmm. So, and I appreciate these comments because this gives us places to look at for further definition. Anything else? Okay, if when you look at it, you see further comments, email those to Marlene, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, obviously, the planning board is being challenged by these issues. And so I think we're facing up to the challenge. And I um, appreciate everybody's input and comments and the staff's efforts. Um, it's not going unnoticed from where I sit. Uh, correspondence, oh, got a big thick folder here. Hang with me while we get through this. <clears throat> the first item uh, in correspondence is, is from uh, Michael Palmer. It was concerning the precinct meetings. Um, Doug has already last night, for, of course, Tuesday nights, we can never cover that because we always meet, or almost always meet, and so we don't have a, a representative at East Falmouth Elementary School unless Rich is there. Um, Doug was uh, kind enough to cover Precinct 3 last night. Are you in Precinct 3, Doug? Uh, no, I was formerly. Now I'm okay. in 9. Okay. Uh, 
a after we after we go through this and, and for just a minute, I th I'd appreciate your comments about how that went for everybody to, to hear. Um, I'm going to be, I'm in precinct eight and nine, but Doug is also, he's gonna cover that. I'm going to cover precinct six <coughs> and seven on Thursday night. Uh, no, uh, five let's and see. Six. Five, uh, five and six, I'm sorry, five and six. I'm, I'm doing, I, I goofed that up. So is, um, <coughs> it, it, can anyone, Cover precinct one, Jim. You, you yeah, one and two. I would like to. You're going to do that. Are they? They're in the same place. Uh, I think they changed yeah. the meeting the library. They yeah, the Main Street Library. library. Okay, that's and that's on thir that's on Thursday night. Thursday night. Yeah. Okay, so Jim's doing that one, and then um, uh, pre. Then let's see. That leaves precinct four. That's tonight, right? Four is tonight. No, that's uh, Monday. That leaves precinct seven only. Then that's not being covered. Can anyone cover that at the Wakoit Congregational Church on Wednesday? That's tomorrow night. Can anybody do that? No. Can't do it. Well, okay, that's that's too bad. Well, <clears throat> we can't be all things to everybody, so. We have a meeting, right? Yeah, we have. I got. Uh, well, Pardon? Uh, we have a subcommittee meeting, and I'm involved in it, so I can't do it. Right. Okay. All right, well, um, these, uh, some of these um, precinct meetings are covered by the press, and uh, as I recall, and so people in those precincts where we don't have a representative, <coughs> excuse me, will have to take advantage of our local press. I have correspondence, something from Mr. Drummy, dated uh, March 13th, to Marlene. There were several questions raised during the meeting, which I think I can answer. These are questions um, concerning performance of the wind turbines and. That was in response to the joint meeting that you had just had with the Board of Health. Okay. All right. Um, would you like me to read this to, to into the record here? It's not all that long. I believe it's probably pretty pertinent. Mr. Uh, first thing was uh, Mr. Latimer asked a question regarding the performance of Win One. He did not want to base recommendations on what may be a faulty turbine. The town's consultant performed this analysis. They found Win One to be operating at or below manufacturer specifications. Number two, there was a discussion regarding how wind noise will mask turbine noise at high wind speeds. This assumption is very common, especially in industry literature. An examination of turbines that have, <clears throat> that have complaints, found with included, reveals the opposite. Complaints occur at higher wind speeds. <coughs> oh, excuse me, Peterson and Van Degg, Van, Van, Vandenberg presented a paper on this topic. They found that the road traffic noise had to be 20 dBA higher in order to mask the turbine noise. They also cite work from Bolin, who found that <clears throat> natural sound from trees or ocean waves needed to be 8 to 12 decibels higher in order to mask turbine sound. In other words, background sound levels need to be significantly higher than turbine sound in order to mask. Number three, Mr. Jones made a remark regarding conducting testing in Falmouth. I have been working with Mass DEP to conduct sound testing on Win 1. This testing should be completed in a few weeks. This may provide some insight for the board regarding how to measure noise from turbines, which is what we discussed tonight. What metric to measure when and how long and what levels may be appropriate in the new bylaw. Four, Mr. And lastly, Mr. Jones also asked a question regarding the history of the current turbines. There are several PowerPoint presentations on the town website under Falmouth Wind Information, which may provide useful background information. I hope the board finds this useful, Mr. Todd, um, Todd Drummy. Um, so when that, when that testing is completed, I assume that he'll probably be sending you another letter, maybe. Yeah. Okay. This will be in the 
file upstairs if you want to read it again. Falmouth Health Department, this is from Mass DEP Wind Turbine Docket. This is This is two This is two this is from the health department to Mass DEP. <clears throat> Ooh. Well, this I'm not going to read because it's too lengthy, but um, can you can you give me a rough idea what this says? Okay. Um, asking them to provide more guidance to asking asking the state of Massachusetts to oh, provide more to, guidance. to provide more guidance. Okay. I believe that's what they indicated in our joint meeting that they were going so to do that. Yeah. So this this will be upstairs uh, for you to read. Um, the next item on the uh, correspondence is to the planning board members from Mr. O'Doherty, dated March 22nd. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a long it's a fairly it's a page and a half. Er, I I could read it. It's it's the last it's the last item of of our um, of our correspondence, and I. Probably it's to the planning board members, so I'm, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. Planning board members, I request to know if the entire seven members of the board participated in a site visit of our neighborhood, as the chairman had promised on October 4th, 2011, in preparation for the January 31st, 2012 public hearing, discussion, and vote regarding the rezoning of 740 Thomas B. Landers Road. Also, please specify if this was a group visit accompanied by the planning staff, a series of individual visits, or a combination. Please provide me with the date and copies of any reports, logs, or notations that were involved in <clears throat> the visit or visits. I'm going to stop right there and say I believe that what we had done there was we all said that we had been, I don't know if all of us did this, but most of us said that we've been by this area many times I have. and that, uh, I, and I do not recall us going there as a planning board we went there Individual. as as individuals I believe and that's that's so that's the response um, I guess we're going to have to draft a letter back to Mr. O'Doherty and that our response would be that we visited it individually and um, on various dates and we did not we did not keep reports logs or notations when we make these visits unless unless anybody did I keep mine up here um, but if anybody did I guess we could say that we do not have any written we do not have any written um, Verification. Uh, we don't have any reports, logs, or notations. All right, to continue. Background. <clears throat> In the May 2011 letter, the planning board invited my wife and me to attend the, the May 24th public discussion concerning a possible zoning change in your, in your, a quote, a possible zoning change in your neighborhood. At the discussion, I witnessed a person saying that Thomas Landers Road is changing. A person. That person's sweeping evaluation inaccurately included my neighborhood. This statement was not challenged by any member of the board. In neophyte, I postulated that perhaps the board members were not all familiar with the neighborhood, despite the meeting agenda item map change on Thomas B. Landers Road. <clears throat> During my time at the podium, after the chairman explained to me how the process would proceed, I made a request of the board members. I asked when they have the opportunity to be in my neighborhood that they come up 
Thomas B. Landers Road from 28 or 28A and take a look at how it appears right now. I said that they would find that it really has not changed a whole lot in 20 years. The chairman thanked me for my comments, but did not mention the board's practice of site visits. Note, I have enclosed excerpts of the planning, Family Planning Board minutes and transcripts of excerpts of the FCTV videos of the Planning Board meetings cited in this letter. At the October 4th public hearing, I again witnessed inaccurate and unchallenged descriptions. At the podium, I reminded the board of my, of my May request. Then I started to ask the board members if they had conducted the requested tours. <clears throat> I asked a member whether or not he could see a cell phone tower from my neighborhood. As the member was saying that he couldn't speak to whether he could see the tower from there, the chairman interrupted me. He said that it would be more appropriate for me to stay with things that were more germane to the general area there and not specifically to whether or not we have been there. He did not want to stifle my comments, but he didn't think that those questions would be appropriate. I responded that Others had had the opportunity to describe my neighborhood earlier in the hearing, and I was trying to clarify that the area is not as had been described. I was asking that before the board votes on a decision to recommend or not recommend this, they drive through the neighborhood and take a look at what it actually does look like, that they determine in reality whether or not you can see the cell phone towers, the dump, and such things claimed by others earlier in the hearing. The chairman said, quote, <clears throat> when we have anything in front of the board here, we do site visits. It's customary for us to go generally with the staff and visit the sites that are in question. And if we can't go with the staff, then we choose, some of us, because of conflicting schedules, to go on our own. So I think you should have confidence that we are familiar with the area that is in question, unquote. I left the podium realizing that, unfamiliar with the site visit practice, I had underestimated the thoroughness with which this board operates and had conducted an inappropriate challenge. I stayed until the end of the meeting and apologized to the member I had questioned and to the chairman. Throughout the remaining meetings I attended, I don't recall mention of the site visits having been conducted. The minutes of the meetings between October 4th and January 31st First, make no mention of site visits. During the board's discussion on January 31st, there were no mentions of the site visits. <clears throat> during the recess in March 13th, during a research, uh, excuse me, during a recess in March 13th's joint meeting with the Board of Health, the chairman initiated a conversation with me that included a new rock wall in my neighborhood the geological origins of the area and nearby Bourne Farm. After the conversation, I realized that I had never read nor heard any report about a site visit. Thank you for your attention and action on this issue. Sincerely, Hugh O'Doherty. Included are excerpts of planning board minutes and from citing meetings and transcripts excerpts of the planning board me meeting minutes from the cited meetings, oh, the ones that he cited in here, transcripts of selected portions of planning board meetings for FCTV. All right, so <clears throat> that's the letter, and there's transcripts here that you can, you can read if you want to. I, it's, it, it's, it appears to me that we need to draft a response to Mr. O'Doherty and saying first what I said already, um, and then whatever else you all think we ought to say. Uh, Ken. I would like to put in that letter about <coughs> the site visits, you know, like you mentioned, but I would also put it is not our policy or is it customary for any member of the board to challenge any member of the public. That's not what we do. We are here to uh, take their comments, and it's not our right to challenge what they're saying. So, so in other words, when he's saying, you know, someone else said in the public and made a statement that was inaccurate, them. we didn't, we didn't necessarily challenge. And Jim, 
just to be more specific, I don't think he, I think I was one of the ones he was challenging, asked me I'd never been there. I drive my daughter to work uh, up at the Associates, up that street, I've probably done it 20 times in the last two years. I've stopped in his neighborhood, put an open house sign, walked in the street, put an area, gone there two hours later, taken it down. I did that every weekend, over and over again. I don't really think I need to do a site visit to a part of town that I visit weekly. And I, I understand his concern that I don't know where he lives, but I want to assure him, since the time I used to dive, drive the town truck to the old dump, I know that street pretty well. Other comments? Uh, yes, Doug. I'm very familiar with the site. I have a shop in the industrial park, and I'm down there almost every day. And I watched that lot as it progressed, and right. I'm very familiar with that property. I've yes, probably Bob. driven down that road twice a day for 30 years, yeah. so I'm very familiar. <laughs> I don't think there's a question about our being familiar with it. I, I and, do. And I had, and I did get out and walk that property at one time too. Right. I do think that also we should add into the, uh, in in our letter that it is not customary for us to discuss our site visits when we're discussing uh, applications. We, we, we don't formally say we did that. We went did it. We almost almost. Well, we always do a site visit with the staff unless we do it individually. But we don't make a public comment that it is recorded in the minutes that we have done that. It's just something we do. And so I think Mr. O'Doherty um, needs to know that we do site visits all the time, but that we don't refer to them having been accomplished when we begin discussion on on applications. Does anybody else have anything that they would like to add? <clears throat> would, would you be kind enough to ask Joyce to uh, I'll draft, it. draft it for it? And, and I'll draft it. You, okay. I, and I, I don't mind signing it. I mean, I, I, I will sign it. Oh, that would be fine. Thank you, Brian. The last thing in our um, in our uh, Correspondence is the uh, the warrant articles that uh, of which we have um, several, and uh, um, we will we will be uh, required to I will be required to speak at, to those along with Brian, and I will say right now that on Tuesday I may be a little bit late because of a an, of an obligation I have at work, and. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping that I will be able to be there on time, but I have asked Pat to cover for me in case one of our articles comes up and I'm not there. So she said she would speak to you, Brian, about that possibility. Yes. Tuesday, I believe, um, we do this. They, they start with a special and then they go back to the um, yes. annual if they hadn't finished it. Well, and our planning board articles I believe are fairly close to the front in the gen in the, in the special in the, time in the, meeting in the, in the right up front. Right? I'm sorry. At the special time meeting I think we're right after unpaid bills. Okay, but in the in the in the uh, in the in the annual meeting aren't we right up front there? Thereabouts, yeah. Okay, so those should be covered on right. so there's there's a possibility, Pat, that I'm Pass the baton. Not that you haven't done it many times before, but I wanted everybody to know that. Um, <clears throat> I take care of correspondence. Are there any items for future um, meetings that you want uh, the staff to put on our agendas um, that you can think of right now? Our next meeting is going to be on the 10th of April, and can you give us a rough idea of what you talked tonight a little bit about the fact that we're going to go through the wind turbine issue again? Correct. And are there any other items that you know of now? That's the primary item. There might be some other issues, but I'd like the board to focus on the, the bylaw you, you initiated tonight. Okay. Uh, and uh, advance your discussion. And the local comprehensive plan, would there be any? I don't think so. Not, there, there wouldn't be any more at that, at that time? Okay. Um, 
We're, you're, you're planning to bring the, the, the first phase of the local comprehensive plan to fall town meeting, is that correct? These three elements. Just these three? Just these three. Okay. We are currently also <coughs> working, as you know, with that subcommittee uh, with the EDIC and the uh, Board of Selectmen on economic sustainability. We've mm. chosen to take what we consider to be the most difficult elements to tackle first. Mm. And, and that's, that's one of them, right? <coughs> Boy, yeah. Um, that one, economic sustainability, I don't believe there is any chance that that's going to come up in the fall. Right. I recall the, the facilitator we had from Bourne <coughs> who said when they did their local comprehensive plan. Wes Yule. They, it took them like three months to do that one element because it was so difficult, you know. I, I, and so I can't imagine it's going to be any less difficult for us than it was for Bourne. Anyway. I think Wes wrote the plan too, did he not? I don't know. I, I think he was the author of it. Maybe you can plagiarize a little there or something. <laughs> well, actually, I do have a copy. But. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't, I would not. I do not envy you on, on dealing with that one at all. Anything else from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meetings adjourned.